Pictured here is the north-south cross-section through southern Ontario, Lake Erie, the Lake Plain, and the edge of the Allegheny Plateau called the Portage Escarpment, capped by the erosion-resistant conglomerate of Little Mountain. Think of this 70-mile side view of the Earth's crust as having been cut by a giant chainsaw, exposing all the geologic formations in their oldest to youngest sequence from the bottom up. Notice that the rocks are tilted to the southeast. This tilt is called a regional dip by geologists. Shown grossly exaggerated in this drawing, it is only 20 feet per mile, but still enough to cause Devonian age limestone that appear on the surface in Ontario to be deeply buried under Little Mountain. Pictured here is an excerpt from ODNR's Reconnaissance Bedrock Geology of the Mentor Ohio Quadrangle. The colors on the map represent rock formations exposed at the surface or directly underneath the soil. The gold-colored area represents the 360 million year old shales of the Ohio Formation, the oldest surface rock in the region. Above the Ohio Formation are the silt stones and sandstones of Bedford and Berea Formations shown in green. The next unit, shown in blue-gray, is the Cuyahoga Formation consisting of soft shales forming gentle slopes buried in glacial till, thin soils, and vegetation. Little Mountain owes its existence to the two areas shown in pink, depicting the Sharon Formation made up of erosion-resistant sandstone and conglomerate. It forms a protective cap on the summit, in common with many hilltops in northeast Ohio whose names include the word ledges. This sketch shows the thicknesses, formation names, and rock types that outcrop in northeast Ohio. Notice that the Chagrin Shale is over 615 feet thick and extends under Lake Erie. Our purpose here is to show the relationship between the rock formations in Stebbins Gulch and Little Mountain. The Stebbins rocks are part of the Devonian system deposited in shallow marine waters of the Ohio Bay some 360 million years ago. The Sharon Formation that caps Little Mountain was deposited 45 million years later during the beginning of the Pennsylvanian period. By this time, the Ohio Bay had been completely buried by sediments eroding from high mountains to the east and north. The sands and gravels that make up today's Sharon conglomerate were deposited by topical rivers flowing to the south across a broad rolling plain. Six events in the life of Little Mountain are shown here from upper left to lower right. Beginning in the upper left, the slopes leading up to the outcrop today covered with glacial till, soil, and vegetation are underlain by a marine shale called Meadville, member of the Cuyahoga Formation, deposited about 350 million years ago. Next, regional uplift caused the seas to retreat, exposing the Meadville shale to erosion. Next, mountain building and erosion about 315 million years ago caused sand and gravel to be deposited by south-flowing rivers, later compacted into the Sharon Formation. Next, a long period of erosion or non-deposition followed, causing a 315 million year gap in the geologic record of Ohio. By 5 million years ago, the Sharon conglomerate had been eroded into a series of isolated hilltops. Next, about 1.7 million years ago, mile-high continental glaciers pushing south from Canada bulldozed the landscape and deposited great quantities of glacial till. Finally, the glaciers began melting and receding some 12,000 years ago, exposing Little Mountain to today's erosion by rain, snow, and ice. This big piece of Sharon conglomerate was ripped off the top of Little Mountain by Pleistocene Age glaciers and then shoved two and a half kilometers or one and a half miles westward to its current location in Holden's Baldwin Natural Area. The boulder now sits on top of a deep glacial till with no connection to any bedrock beneath it. Doug Ralston, one of our tallest VIP guides at well over six feet, is posing in front of the boulder for scale. Not only is the sandstone and conglomerate the same as that on Little Mountain, but oddly enough, this remote boulder is covered with the same species of mosses, lichens, and polypody ferns that we find growing on conglomerate outcrops at Little Mountain. Like thousands of 19th century vacationers who preceded us on Little Mountain, modern day visitors spend time on guided tours wandering through the cracks, joints, and crevasses of the Sharon conglomerate. This is a rough sketch of our crooked path at the edge of the picturesque outcrop 
showing locations of the more interesting features. We will take a closer look at the Devil's Kitchen and the tight squeeze which are shown at the top of the map and an area called Honeycomb Weathering near the bottom. This cave-like opening, covered by graffiti dating back to the 1860s, has fascinated generations of Little Mountain visitors. The enclosure appears to have formed along a rock joint that was later enlarged by a partial roof collapse. Devil's Kitchen is a smelly place. Upon first entering the kitchen, many visitors detect a sulfurous smell that may have led to its ominous name, but the smell is perfectly natural, caused by the chemical breakdown of an iron sulfide mineral called pyrite, or fool's gold. Pyrite is part of the cement that binds the quartz grains and pebbles that make up the conglomerate. Sulfur-reducing bacteria eat sulfate irons, reducing it to hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg ga gas. Hydrogen sulfide has the interesting property of numbing a person's sense of smell. After a few minutes in the kitchen, the odor can no longer be detected. In addition to being a smelly place, Devil's Kitchen is also quite muddy. In wet weather or dry, the kitchen is floored in several inches of stagnant water or gooey organic mud. The arrow in the photo points to the back door of the kitchen. It's low and narrow and can be a challenge for some folks to squeeze through. Some visitors choose not to risk the mud or tight squeeze and that's not a problem. During the few minutes of interpretation in the kitchen, they can wait at the front opening. The trail route goes through the back door, turns hard left, and then circles around some big rocks back to the front opening where everyone joins up again. Here is a Swiss cheese-like weathering pattern known as honeycomb weathering. It occurs in sandstones that contain iron minerals in the cement that holds the rock together. It is an example of differential weathering. Local weaknesses in the cement strength causes shallow depressions to form on the rock wall. The ridges that surround the depressions preferentially draw groundwater from the outcrop where it evaporates more quickly than in the depressions. This causes iron minerals dissolved in the groundwater to precipitate around the edges above the depressions, further armoring them against erosion. The resistant projections keep getting higher and the pits keep getting deeper, resulting in the honeycomb pattern we see here. This sketch represents a slice through Little Mountain. A massive layer of highly permeable conglomerate caps the hilltop and protects it from erosion. Underneath the conglomerate is a thick layer of weak impermeable shale. As groundwater slowly sinks through the conglomerate, it accumulates at the contact between the two rock types, forming a lubricated zone at the base of the conglomerate. At the same time, gradual erosion of the relatively weaker shale begins to undercut the edges of the conglomerate cliff, causing the conglomerate to break along natural joint planes into house-sized blocks that slowly slide down the slope. Known in Pennsylvania and New York as rock cities, this pattern occurs wherever massive beds of sandstone or conglomerate overlie shale or deep slopes of the Allegheny Plateau. This photo shows a slump block of Sharon conglomerate. It's separated from the main outcrop and is now imperceptibly sliding down the hillside on a water lubricated layer of glacial clay or shale. The bedding planes in the rock are tilted about 35 degrees to the left or north. If this scene were the Rockies or the Alps, we would conclude that the 35 degree tilt, geologists would call it a 35 degree dip, was caused by tectonic folding of deeply buried rock layers exposed to great stress during mountain building and continental collisions. Nothing like this has happened at Little Mountain. What we see here is simply the combined effect of erosion, soil saturation, and slow gravity-induced creep. During the hotel era, Little Mountain vacationers loved to explore the advertised caves located along the outer rim of the summit. Of course, using the term cave for a feature like the one pictured here is a misnomer. It doesn't have a roof and there's no limestone here for acid waters to dissolve, a process needed to form the caverns, passages, stalactites, and other classic features associated with solution caves. Instead, this is what geologists call a joint, or simply a naturally caused crack in the rock strata. It may not be a cave, but this joint is truly impressive. Over 20 feet deep and 5 to 10 feet wide and 200 feet long, 
Starting out as a narrow crack in the rock, it gradually widened under the force of gravity. As tempting as it is to explore the entire length of the big joints at Little Mountain, we don't allow it because they provide critical nesting habitat for the birds that rarely breed in Ohio. Although only a few inches across, the opposing sides of this joint drop straight down some 20 feet, all the way to the base of the outcrop. If you look down the fracture, you can see small white pebbles of the Sharon Formation standing out on the shadowed walls of the joint. Visitors sometimes confuse rock joints with geologic faults. They're not the same. A rock joint is a planar fracture, one where the two sides have simply moved farther apart without any horizontal, left to right, or vertical, up or down displacement relative to one another. If we could push the two bodies of rock on opposite sides of the break back together again, they would line up exactly as they did before the fracture. In contrast, a geologic fault not only breaks the rock unit into two, but offsets the two sides along the fault plane. The displacement can vary from a few inches to over a hundred miles, depending on the type of fault.